Maybe it's someone we we're expecting to. Uh... Sure. Yeah. And is for, is this for being oh. recorded? Then it did, I just heard it say being recorded. Okay. But now the attendee's gone, so maybe yeah. that. And I'm know. not receiving any notification oh. that There's I Janet. see this Janet now. I don't see anyone. No one's emailed me. Oh, that's right. Fred. There, Fred's also as a. Oh. Atta oh, attendee, panel. Oh, I'm gonna bring them over. I guess right. I can do that. I need to do that with Ted with Fred. Uh, promote the panelist. Good. I don't. If you want to. Oh, that's fine. And there's Bruce. Oh, Bruce is here too. Okay. Are there? I don't remember. Am I allowed to promote people as I deem fit, or do we need to like open the meeting somehow first before I can let a non official member join the discussion? Oh, Karen's joining. Okay. Great. Hey, Karen. Hello, everyone. We did it. Yay. Yes, well done, Jesse. <laughs> okay. So, Nate, do I need to say official stuff to start the meeting? Jesse, I can't hear you. I don't know if you're muted again. Oh, no, I'm not muted. No, he's not no. muted. Can you hear me, Matt, Nate? Apparently not. Interesting. You can hear me, Jesse, can you? I can, I can hear you. And I can hear you. And there's no chat, so I can't tell Nate we can hear each other. <laughs> and he doesn't appear to be muted, according to the uh, symbol symbols. Karen's muted, Fred's muted, Janet's muted. But mm -hmm. not not Nate. Oh, he's coming back. I think he's... Trying to reconnect. He was just telling me he has a new computer, so... Oh, okay. He's learning, he's learning the buttons. <clears throat> okay so assuming i'm supposed to open the meeting this is uh june 24th meeting of the amherst plenty board housing subcommittee nate do i have to say anything else besides that oh we can do roll call attendance okay we'll have roll call attendance um i'll just go in order that i'm seeing you you can unmute and say you're present or not. <laughs> Fred Hardwell? I am present. Great. Bruce? Here. Yeah. Karen? Here. Yeah. And I, Jesse Major, am present as well. And we've added Janet McGowan to the discussion group as well. Okay, so I, I don't have minutes yet from the last meeting. I'll get that up for next time for us to approve, uh, along with these ones, hopefully. Uh, we had a few agenda items, um, but I think we're going to skip to the front of the line, these draft overlay versions that Nate sent us uh, yesterday. Um, Everyone um, received those two versions for discussion? I did. It's not on the agenda, but uh, so that's okay. Yeah. Well, yeah. I, I, I had put... That's a good question. Nate, is it okay for us to discuss these? Sure. It could be an unanticipated item. I mean... Okay. The idea is that it's going to come to the planning board on um, yeah Wednesday. I certainly certainly like to. I read them or at <laughs> least. I've read the what I, yeah I um, yeah okay. I'm ready for that. Good. Okay. good. Ja Janet, did you want to add something? Oh, I just thought it was on the agenda on the town webs the calendar. So the overlay discussion was. I think so. Am I am I miss or maybe? I I oh you're muted again. Oh. Um, I thought it was mixed use or something. I thought it was maybe yeah, I but I didn't put the words overlay because I wasn't sure we were gonna have anything in time. Okay. So it did say mixed use versus uh, apartment or dorm, something like that. Yeah. So yeah, I think it's part of that discussion if we interpret loosely. Um, Nate, do you wanna start us off and tell us? I mean, I, I think the differences in these two were pretty clear looking at them. Thank you for highlighting it, but maybe you just want to introduce for us. What yeah, I, I think, you know, I met with staff after the last planning board meeting and uh, we thought it'd be good to, you know, present two options. I mean, you know, say 95% of it's similar. Uh, it's really just the, um, you know, one is requires, it's only mixed use buildings, right? So the overlay is only for mixed use buildings and it has a little bit different strategy in terms of how to 
you know, what percentage is, it uses actually a length of a percent of a street facade, not a gross floor area to a certain depth, right? So we're saying 75% of the first floor, ground floor facing the street back 24 feet. Um, and so then, you know, every building would have that requirement. Um, and then the other one is similar to the overlay we had been looking at uh, where, you know, it's only mixed use 500 feet from the intersection and then social dormitories and apartments are allowed um, and mixed use, but, you know, they're all, those other residential uses are allowed in the interior of the corridor. Um, you know, uh, we, we had a six floor for both step back. Um, we have pretty generous setbacks. Uh, the right of way is actually really wide there too. So, I mean, most buildings would be um, 35 or 40 feet back from the curb uh, road, you know, the, the road curb. Um, and that, you know, and then we uh, clarified kind of that setback on the West side uh, to allow for a 10 foot pedestrian path. And so, um, yeah, I mean, we haven't been overly prescriptive in either of the versions with some things. And so previous versions, you know, had some really detailed, like every eight feet, you'd have a change in plane, but we have language saying there is this articulation and it's really then going to be part of the review of the project because I think it's too hard. You know, if we, if we maybe at the end of the downtown design standards, if we have something and we want to put it here, but I don't, I don't really want to get too prescriptive right now without really understanding how that would work. Um, but yeah, those are the two, two versions. Yeah. Great. Um, I just had, I really just one question about the step back for the sixth floor. Mm -hmm. The idea would be we just review that each with each project rather than saying, here's how much of these step back. Is that what you were thinking? Yeah. I mean, I spoke with the building commissioner about like, you know, how is there a right depth in terms of, um, you know, any like architectural loads or, you know, building, you know, integrity. And he didn't really think so. So, um, you know, and we could have a proportion or something. I mean, we could write something and, you know, at one point I was like, oh, would it be 10 or 12 feet or, or is it like a proportion to the height or something? But the overall height is still only, you know, we're saying that for what was like 65 feet, which isn't much taller than what we had proposed with five floors. I think we're really saying that, you know, they can build within, within that, right? So they don't have, they don't need, you know, 10, 12 foot floors, every floor. So um, the overall height of the building actually isn't much higher than a, a five-story building, um, but. Um, okay, other thoughts and questions, Bruce? Uh, just a minute, somebody's walking in my door. But, uh, but uh, uh, my, it's my wife's birthday and people are dropping in uh, and expectedly. Uh, um, Karen, why don't you go and I'll come in a minute. I'm being distracted at the moment should, by should this. Should we sing uh, happy birthday, Bruce? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'm, um, I got my things in so she can't hear anything, but I can hear all of the chatter in the. Now they've gone outside. Actually, I can go. Um, so I agree, Nate. I think that the, uh, especially since we've got this downtown design standards uh, thing that's ramping up and so forth, it's pretty clear that we are in a much better position uh, in, uh, I don't know, a few months, let's say, to do something here. And given that this is a process that we're initiating that goes to the council, that probably goes to the CRC, that probably comes back to us or this council and back to, and, you know, it's some ping pong thing. So we've got plenty of opportunity to do this and probably do it better. So I think that keeping it more or less uh, uh, as you've done, I think that the setback is fine. The notion that it's set back is it says that helps people say, well, it's six stories, but basically it's the same. We ha we've had an extra story, but we haven't had a, really a height limitation. And, and the extra story is diminished by it, the requirement of the setback. So I think that pretty much eases uh, it makes it possible, at least for me, I mentioned, to argue that there's no, there's little or no effective difference between five and six stories. It puts the challenge on the designers to make it appear the same. So I, I that whole approach of, of, of pulling, of not having uh, embedded standards, at least not yet, um, I support. Number two, um, uh, which order should I do this? Number two, number two is when I read these, I thought that we should have a goal statement. And the question is, I certainly think it should be in the mixed use standard and it could be in both. But basically in uh, 
I'm just going to flick my screen across here to where you've got uh, the first um, uh, the purpose statement. I'm thinking that in the mixed use, there should be a final sentence that says something to the effect that it is the, uh, the, the goal or the objective to retain a vibrant commercial retail presence on the University Drive Street or something to that effect. So it basically says that the, 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 the goal of this overlay, whatever else is in there with housing and so forth, which is certainly the, the, the goal that we want to change, but, what, but I think we should make a statement, at least in one of these, that what we want to preserve is the uh, vibrant commercial activity on the street. I would suggest it could go into both because I think it's a. I don't think it's not a goal in number two. It's, but I certainly think it should go in 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 the first one, and that I think will help because uh, I um, I know about you or others. I bet I've been receiving some uh, emails from Kathy Shane, who's my local. She's a she's a friend. She's also the district councillor from our part of the woods, and she's she's been watching this, and she's got these various concerns, and I think. Uh, both uh, Karen and I have uh, uh, responded uh, to her, but but the conversation I've had with Kathy suggests that being clear about the the goal to retain the the the, the street vitality would be a good thing to put in there. Uh, that's number two. Number three. Uh, this is number four, but I'm going to say it first because it's quick and short. Uh, is that I, I think it might be something that we don't necessarily choose between these. Maybe let's say we have a discussion at the board and uh, it's not overwhelming support for either one or the other. Um, the idea that we would forward both of these options to the CRC and to the council would seem to me to be um, quite reasonable and maybe a good idea. And number four is just a question uh, because when I see, and I'm going to slide myself across again, to the standards and conditions in the mixed use, you've got um, uh, golly, where is it? Uh, third. Oh, there it is. Yes, mixed use buildings. At least 30% of the gross floor area of the first or ground floor shall be any permitted non-residential use. And then the statement for, um, oh, I think this is the mixed use one. That was for the uh, for the housing um, yeah. and dominant. The, the For the mixed use, it's at least 75% of the street facing facade of the first one shall be any not. So one says it's 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 a linear dimension of the street facing facade and the other one is a 30% of the gross floor area. And I, 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 so I'm interested in why there's a difference there. Why is one, it's, I'm intrigued basically. I don't have an opinion. I really don't understand and I would like to understand why you've got one standard in one side and the other standard, uh, one standard in one option and the other standard in the other option. What's the difference? How do they work as drivers? What's the mechanics of each? So that's a question and the other three are comments. Thanks, Bruce. Nate, do you wanna to respond to the, the last question? Uh, yeah, I mean, I guess if others are willing to, to wait, um, I think, you know, some of it was, you know, speaking with the, you know, with staff, we were, we were the thirty percent is what's in the bylaw, and you know what we've heard from a few uh, applicants and developers is that depending on the building orientation, um, depending on how much of you know the streetscape there is, thirty percent actually goes pretty deep into the building, and so then they're actually you know they can build out one hundred percent of the building, and say they go back a fair number of feet, but they're still not at thirty percent, and so. Um, you know, so we we're, we were just trying something different. If we're requiring mixed use all, um, along the whole corridor, and so um, you know, it could be that in some buildings, it's actually more than thirty percent. The twenty-four feet is a minimum, and so you know, we think about what a if it's a double-loaded corridor, how wide a building would be, and if they want a restaurant, you know, if someone's planning for that, then it might be deeper. But uh, I mean, some of it is really if we want kind of that vibrant streetscape, and I agree that we could have a different or additional statements. Uh, added to the purpose for that, for the mixed use, particularly. 
um, you know, we think having that majority of the facade be, you know, um, say a non-residential use is, is important. So the concern might be that the 30% growthful area may not actually get that right. Someone might, although it kind of says it, they might not quite get there. And so we're trying to be more direct. Um, and, and, you know, and again, it's, we haven't ground truthed it yet, but, uh, yeah. Well, it's it's good to me, uh, and and again, it's it's an argument for submitting both of these too because you've got two different mechanisms. One's an area uh, limiter, and the other's a linear limiter, and people can it, it it stimulates thought about how it can be done. And again, I don't think at this point we have to know it's right. I think we have to know we've got a sound process and a and a good solid discussable proposition. And my sense is that. They're pretty much there. Yeah. Great. Thanks both. Uh, Karen, you're up next. Um, can I quickly ask, I, I know I, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. When did we go to six floors? Mm -hmm. Are we, have we really decided that we're going to allow six floors with the setback? Uh, because last time I was involved, we were talking about five. And is the Barry Roberts thing six floors? Just a quick question. The, um, yeah, I mean, it's something, you know, we had asked at the planning board and there was not really, um, you know, there's been some mention of it, wasn't really a big consensus. Uh, staff had thought, well, if we add just a few more feet to height, but say you can go to six floors, then, you know, you're, you know, it's not as if we're going up to like 75 feet to have these tall floors. We're actually, someone is going to actually have to build within, you know, kind of a, a shorter um, floor dimension, you know, floor to ceiling dimension. Um, but it's not, you know, again, this is kind of a proposal, right? So it, it may be that, you know, six floors is too tall. We were thinking, well, especially with the mixed use one, if we're getting, if we want to even have more of the ground floor be non-residential, would the trade-off be then you can have a additional floor stepped back from the facade, you know, and, and the setbacks are so big that it's, you know, hopefully it's not as imposing as if it were, you know, 10 feet from the curb, right? And like I said, these buildings are going to be um, 35 feet um, or more from the curb, maybe, you know, even sometimes 45. Um, and the Barry Roberts project, I think is only five. Um, at one point, maybe in a the concept there was taller or some initial discussion, but um, I think it's just five. Yeah, I'm looking at it now. I think it's five. Yeah. And with setbacks though. So. Yeah. So I've been really counting the floors around here, um, the city of Berlin around me and, um, it's generally five floors is a, a, a good height. Um, and when it gets above that, there's a big difference. It's it's true. You can make the floors sort of shorter, but then the living space, it gets to be more of a squat sort of cram and in sort of thing. I personally still like five floors for for our area. Just aesthetically, it makes a big difference, I think. Okay. Thanks, Karen. Um, Fred, you're up next. Uh, thank you. Uh, well, I, I think the uh, uh, Nate's suggestion about uh, making six floors look like five floors is frankly ingenious. Uh, I'm fully in support of that, particularly since we are in one of the few places of town where um, there is no uh, uh, residential, uh, existing residential uh, development that uh, would be uh, endangered by it. Uh, so I, I uh, Nate, I have one question. Uh, I, I think I'm in favor of the, the sixth floor, uh, the, the way you've done it. Um, what really got my attention at the last planning board meeting was your argument that uh, if we build it, they won't come. And uh, that uh, I think is the $64 question. And I'm wondering if you could compare these two uh, with that particular argument in mind. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it's interesting, you know, I, I feel like um, Amherst is a really unique, you know, even more so than just, you know, town or two over in terms of the housing demand. Um, you know, the non-residential space, you know, um, you know, the 
I think the retail commercial space, it's interesting. There's a lot of vacancy, um, you know, say regionally and, you know, acute in certain areas. Um, but in terms of not building it um, and not coming, I'm building and not coming, I think, you know, the concern would be if we required mixed use, you know, what would happen? Um, I do actually think on University Drive that we're going to get, eventually we'll have enough density that there's, you know, you can have, um, you know, non-residential uses and it'll be, it'll be working. And so, you know, after the planning board meeting, you know, I, th I think it was, you know, it was, it was a good discussion. I think staff thought, well, right. If in Jesse, I think made the point that if we're, you know, if we're looking at what, what do we really want there and say 10 or 15 years, and we don't want to be short-sighted and say, recommend something and then have something in motion that we have to change quickly. Um, you know, do we allow mixed use uh, and then maybe another floor to, to balance the development and really get, you know, get both right. Have housing and uh, commercial retail space, because, you know, I do think that the housing piece is something was the original driver of this, right? Like, can we, can we actually have enough development here to, um, you know, take pressure off some of the other neighborhoods? And I, I, you know, I actually think that with this and possibly other things happening in Hadley and maybe elsewhere in town, I think, you know, in so many years, I actually do feel like we would have, we'd see a kind of shift in the housing market in some areas. And that's, to me, that's a, a really a good benefit of this. Um, but, you know, I don't, I actually think that if things say, talking about the first floor mixed use, if that stays vacant for a bit, I think eventually it will be occupied. And so, you know, and maybe that's something that's willing, that's worth waiting for, right? Um, yes, thank, thanks, Nate. Uh, Janet. Thank you. Um, there's a couple of things I wanted to talk to, but sticking on the heights mixed use front um, and the sixth floor, I guess that's, those are three big things. I um, I think we should, I like the idea of requiring at least 75% of the, you know, the street front to be occupied because that was part of our, that was a big part of our vision is to make it a street where there's canopies and there's people and there's restaurants and daycare centers and stuff. And we do, we have very low vacancy rates, storefronts in everywhere, but I think okay. North. Okay. And so um, I don't think that's an issue. There's a study that was done that we we're sending over $200 million out to Hadley and other communities. And I think 20 or 25 million in groceries alone. And so, um, you know, and then we have the world, this, the areas, the region's largest employer and people will be literally driving as they do every day out of the university down that road. And so I think the more open, more commercial and retail, the more people will use it and they'll stop and you know it become a much more vital area. So I have literally no concerns for that. Um, I do have concerns that six story, you know, residential mixed use buildings could drive the medical facilities and even the grocery store out. And so I kind of began to wonder why are we privileging housing? Why not, if we're gonna go to five stories, why not just say five stories build what you need and maybe it's going to be an office. Um, probably not given that we have a big empty office building there, but um, not to push stuff in one direction or the other. Um, I was a little startled by six floors because I thought, you know, I thought if Doug Marshall doesn't want a six floor, you know, that's going to be, um, you know, he had such a visceral reaction. I think it wouldn't be such a big deal if you step back from the fourth floor to five or six stories. I don't think you feel that on the street. Um, but I think if we're going to keep giving extra stories, we've already given two extra stories with fifth floor. If it's three for sixth floor, let's get something else. And so let's get more inclusionary zoning, maybe for sort of middle class people, um, maybe give the sixth story if you're going to do a, a building that's not student housing. So you get some space for, um, you know, all the rest of us. Um, I have many friends who have tried, who have sold their homes in Amherst, looked around for a condo or to rent and couldn't find anything that was in good shape and not super expensive. It could be in bad shape and expensive or in great shape and very expensive. And so I think if we're giving extra floors, we should get something for, you know, either middle-class or low-income residents. Um, you know, and I keep on looking at that Barry Roberts development, which I really know nothing about other than the pictures. And he thinks it's feasible to build four and five stories, mixed use, 30% um, retail, commercial, with parking. And so I think if it's six stories, it's really feasible to do that. And so let's let's not back off from requirements that are sensible. And so 
I would say if we go to six stories, we need to add, get something more for the town. And I think it's really to the benefit of everybody. If we have more low income housing there, that means that people with of lesser means have a place they can walk to shop and work, you know, and get to their jobs and stuff like that. So, um, so the sixth floor doesn't bother me unless it's just sort of like we just, you know, why not seven? Why not 10? Um, so that those are kind of my feelings. I think we could require the 75 percent on the first floor street, but I think we should keep the 30 percent. That is the lowest percentage of any town that we studied. Um, and so it's not a big ask. And so and people can do it. And it could be a you know, daycare center. It could be a dental place. It could be a tattoo parlor. It, you know, there's just a ton of stuff and there's tons of little stores all over the place. And it's an opportunity for entrepreneurs to come in and get a start. And so I just, I think we're we're giving a good benefit. We're, we're dangling this very lucrative thing. We have a really lucrative student housing market. So let's let's build the vision that we started out talking about, which is a vibrant commercial street filled with trees and awnings and people and bikes and strollers and students you know, maybe they party at night and we all go to bed, you know, <laughs> but we've already shopped there. And so I, I don't think we have to, I think we, and I don't think we should go to um, the town council and say, here's two smorgasbords and, you know, pick and choose. It's, it's kind of, let's go with a good vision that we most, all of us or all of us can support. And I think if Barry Roberts can build something with 30% you know, commercial on the first floor with parking at four or five stories, anybody can build something with more. And so, and the, the last thing I want to say is, I and it's kind of, it looks like we're not requiring parking for any commercial or retail uses. I, I looked at the, and that just seemed shocking to me. So I, that was a big download right there. Thanks, Janet. Um, Nate, do you want to talk about the parking that you had in mind there? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that, you know, there's no other parking nearby. And so, you know, they can't rely on, you know, downtown, we have the municipal parking district, but we have a lot of public, you know, on street and off street parking, we have other private lots. And so, you know, a developer, um, you know, doesn't have to try too hard to justify parking. Whereas down here, they're going to have to either they are going to enter into shared parking agreements with their neighbors or across the street, or they're going to have to put it on their property. And so, you know, um, you know, driving, um, to there, if you have mixed use or a restaurant, they, and you, you need a lot of parking. And so to me, you know, and Barry, you know, speaking with Tom about what they proposed down at Amity street, you know, the number of parking spaces was a factor in determining the non-residential space. And so I think if we require mixed use, it's always going to be the conversation is how much parking do we need? And so I don't think we need to prescribe it because they're going to, they're going to come in with it. If, if a developer thinks they don't need to have um, parking for their residential units, you know, maybe the permit granting board says that that has to be a requirement in your lease for every unit, which we do now uh, for some developments. And so the expectation coming in is the only parking that's available might be shared parking or accessible spaces, but, you know, um, it's written into the lease that there isn't. And so you're not, you know, people know going in. Um, so, yeah, I, I think that, you know, if this were in a different location, for instance, maybe we'd have parking requirements, but given its location, you know, the, you know, there's not really any proximity to neighborhood streets and, and off street parking, on street parking isn't allowed nearby either. So I think it's really forcing each, each developer, each prop project to kind of consider what are the options nearby. Well, um, you're actually making my argument for me is that there's no alternative to parking except for on site or shared parking. And that's what our parking bylaw says is. You know, it, it doesn't. It says here are minimum requirements, but if you can show you don't need it or you have shared parking, you know, will show us that and we'll agree to it. So we already have this very flexible parking requirement, but I think what you're saying is there's no alternative parking. So of course you're going to put it on site, but what this requirement is, you don't have to put parking in. Like yeah, but, that, but that's, but that's to the developer, right? So I think we require a certain amount of parking per, you know, thousand square feet or seats and for commercial or retail and, Honestly, I think that each project is going to come in and figure out what parking they need to make it successful. And so actually, I think in our our so parking could, bylaw could be what we have here throughout town because, okay. you know, the anyways, the, the two, um, you know, what we have is kind of antiquated. And so uh, how could I think. We, how could the board say, oh, there's no parking requirement in your thing. You built this massive building with mm -hmm. lots of 
commercial and retail and things and we don't require parking so we're going to require parking because the bylaw doesn't give us the authority to do that am i reading this completely wrong we're asking that they have to have provide a management plan and information to be reviewed and so um i, I, I think janet is reading it wrong and i can explain why okay good good help me <laughs> yeah. um janet i think you're reading it wrong because you're not trusting developers to protect their own interests yeah, that was my take on it also, frankly. But it's waiving our park, all our parking requirements for retail, commercial, and residential. And you're just sort of saying. And that's why. But our what, I, what I just said is why you're doing that. So because then, we think we yeah. think that being, uh, I think Nate thinks, and, and the conversations with staff and, and, and the people we employ to inform us on these things are telling us that it is not in our interests to be prescriptive because we're guessing and we'll probably guess wrong. And if we trust the developers to uh, protect their own interests, that those will align with the town's interests. And I'm actually persuaded by that argument. But where do we say come in with the management plan? Where is where is that piece? Because we you've gotten rid of section seven point zero to seven point zero zero five. There's no requirement for parking in an apartment building commercial. Well, yeah, like where do we I'm, get that? i'm not we... able to speak to the intricacies of the bylaw on this matter and i would hope that there would be uh something that that recognizes that uh that that, that, that we're uh, in a collaborative arrangement with a developer with a proposing with an applicant developer uh to explain their interests and what parking they're providing and why that works or not providing Current parking bylaw, which is here's the requirement, but if you can show us that it's the building's going to work, there's flexibility, we'll let you waive those requirements. That's our current parking bylaw. It's very flexible, but it's well, that's very true. That's true. And and uh... but, we're, but we're now waiving that requirement and saying, oh, we hope you come talk to us, but we have no legal authority to require any parking because we don't have it in our overlay anymore. I don't know. It'd be nice to have a chat and say, hey, we think you're wrong on the parking, so but we have no legal authority to require it. Right. So then, if the well, you see, you're 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 not as trusting as I am, apparently. <laughs> but I'm an attorney oh, on a board. Oh, that... <laughs> and I'm 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 I'm, I'm, I'm being persuaded, oh, okay, okay. but let me, uh... let me add a perspective. Maybe that means if we did add that piece from the bylaw as it is, our flexible parking bylaw, if that was mm -hmm. part of this, then they could still come with the proposal, and it might have no parking. And yeah. it would be approved or not approved, but someone's yeah. looking at it. I think that's your point, Janet. If yeah, I, I, I would still waive the shared parking because we require a special permit for that, or you have to have a hundred twenty percent of the required amount on space. So, really, the idea here is to have ultimate flexibility with parking. And so, our bylaw, Janet, you say that it's flexible, but you have to come in and already figure out that you need two spaces unless you can waive it. That's the different that the planning board could deny that waiver. And you're required to have two spaces for every unit. And so to me, that's not flexible. And so what, um, you know, the flexibility actually is saying, come in and propose what you need to us, show you your utilization, have a parking management plan, and the board reviews that. And so, you right, know. So, but that's so, gone. Right. Is that in here? I didn't see that either. The parking it, management. It may have been um, omitted, but um, I, it, it's the intention is that they will be required to submit. Um, right. It is here. Yeah. And, yeah. But it may, it may have been lost a bullet or something. It should be yeah. its own bullet. It's the second bullet under parking. Shared yeah. or leased parking is encouraged in the overlay district. Permit granting authority shall require the submittal of any shared or leased parking agreements and may require submittal of study of right. a study to provide utilization levels. So I think that's saying it will be reviewed and approved or not. It's actually not saying that. It's just saying that if there's a shared or leased parking agreement, you have to show it to us. But we're yeah, and you might, we there might. Should be, yeah. There used to be a bullet, I think, that said the requirement of a submittal of a parking management plan. Um, well, maybe that, maybe, maybe the conversation is around the uh, editing and and, uh, and and massaging of that particular um, phrase in in this bylaw. So but I the, I agree with Nate about the the special permit for the shared and lease parking. I argued three years ago, let's just get rid of that and just let it go under site plan review because that's too messy and crazy. But I'd be rather do that because we already have this super flexible parking plan and under it, we have been providing less parking. 
And so, you know, but I really, you know, you write that the developer should make the right decision and say, hey, I'm going to put in a restaurant, so I have to put seating in. But maybe yeah. they just think, oh, this is just a tattoo place and someone can jump off the bus and in 10 or 20 years, it might be a restaurant. And so I just I just think that we have this super flexible thing and just to, we don't have the legal authority to require parking if we get rid of it all. It's just not there. And if they want a management plan, a management plan for what? Just like, oh, we think that there's no one's going to need parking or people can take the bus. Um, and if people need cars, they can go park up on Amity Street or in mm. some neighborhood. Uh, I'm still thinking, I mean, this is this part, I mean, this is a particular part of town. It's rather unusual. And the, the, uh, and all what's there seems to work for me. And I'm prepared to uh, invest in the in the applicants being able to understand their interests of what they're trying to do. And as far as the future is concerned, uh, we will have somewhat locked in a certain um, modus operandi based on that first development. That's true, uh, I think. Um, so... But I'm, 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 I'm not so confident that I can understand all of the, uh, the, the, the details of the future that uh, that I think that I can um, regulate beyond what we've got here. I'm, I'm comfortable letting the, the letting the applicants, um, driven by their own uh, vested interests and so forth in this in the commercial success of their. Uh, of their application, they've got a far more. They've got a lot. Well, I was going to say they've got more writing on it than we have. They've got a different sorts of things writing on it. Of course, the town has got the future writing on it, and they've got their their initial, uh, their short term economic interests. Both have got significant interests writing on this, but I'm 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 prepared to let the developers, the applicants, the developing applicants. Um, drive the call on parking, given that we have appropriately edited that uh, section of this overlay bylaw that would make it appropriate for this particular part of town. So it would be so it would be like you're not required to provide parking, but you have to give us a parking management plan. Is that it, Nate? Yeah, I mean, so like you know, right now, for instance, like some developers will say in their lease that they don't require, they will actually not provide any parking for any of the residential units. Others think that every unit needs at least one space, and so. You know, based on that, the board could say, "Yeah, okay. If your if your management plan says absolutely no parking, a condition could be that in your lease agreement you have to say that state that there's no parking available, right? That, and so it's an upfront understanding for any prospective tenant that there isn't parking available. Um, and so that's that's where you know to me that becomes part of the review during the permitting. Um, you know how that discussion unfolds. Hmm. Um, maybe... I am saying I am taking some notes, so I, I you know. Um, um, you know, I, I think maybe um, I just want to, you know, it's interesting about um, we have some language in the bylaw that we could look at in terms of the requirement of a management plan or peak parking demand and have some language about whether or not, you know, that the board would use that to um, determine a parking, you know, parking ratios or something. But I think having a standard, you know, like two spaces per unit, unless the board's satisfied or 3.3 .3 seats for every thousand square feet, unless it's satisfied for some, you know, site design or aesthetic is not, you know, the board could say no. And then it just, it really flips the development upside down because now all of a sudden they have to require more parking than they don't think they need. And so I would rather not have any of those strict numbers and have more of a discussion with the permitting board. And so uh, you know, it might take another bullet or two um, to get there. And, and don't forget, this is going to all these other committees. So right. I, 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 I'm not uncomfortable with submitting something that we think needs more work because it's going to get more work regardless. Yeah. yeah. How do people feel about asking for more in exchange for a sixth floor? I, I like that. I mean, in principle, I, I I'm open to being persuaded either way. But in principle, uh, I think uh, we are offering what we think is a, a benefit. It it could be that the uh, the developers will say, well, uh, board uh, members and town, what you don't understand is that the foundation conditions down there are such that uh, the uh, the the what you get is a is a building in the first place of more than one story. Because the f ground conditions are soupy or what have you, I don't. I'm not saying that's true. I'm saying that that's a possible response that we would learn 
that uh, we are why why asking for more than uh, than than uh, why asking for more might uh, put us in the category of uh, dissuading uh, developers to, to 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 take the development mission in the first place. But uh, if uh, uh, absent any overriding uh, situation like that, I uh, I think it it would be nice to uh, to be able to show, particularly on the housing, uh, um, favoring some, one of these, but probably on both, that that what you advocate, Jen, is uh, something that could be uh, put in there. So at the moment, I'm I think that's a good idea. All right. Um, I wanted to weigh in on parking. I, I agree. I actually agree with Nate. I think it should be left flexible because uh, parking is, you know, that, that impermeable space is bad for the environment. And I, I see the trend here right now is even when um, you have parking lots, there's a big pressure to get rid of the parking lots and put playgrounds and green spaces there and you just kind of keep forcing the environmentalists keep forcing the issue that we have to uh we have to encourage people to think of alternative transportation and to push that and um so i i know that that was an issue with the the houses in town that they did bring cars and it put a lot of parking pressure on the neighborhoods like our neighborhood that it's always going to be a problem, but I do think we should not put something so inflexible that you need two and a half spaces for a unit. I think that's, that's uh, I agree. Let's leave that a little bit up to the developers and, uh, and provide more space for just green space. But ask, and then I agree with Janet, if you are going to go with six floors and I, I still don't like it. I don't like six floors. Just I think it's a huge difference between six floors and five floors, unless you can really make those floors really squat them in. But if you're going to give something like that, then you should ask for um, units in there that are affordable and, and other things. No way. Thanks, Karen. Brent. Yeah, two things. Um, first is uh, regarding... Uh, <clears throat> Uh, the issue of potential ground issues, uh, whether they could support uh, a floor of that size. I, I think uh, the the boots on the ground, which would be Barry Roberts at the corner, uh, clearly thinks that he can put five floors because uh, that's what he has a permit to do and that's what he applied for. And uh, what Nate is suggesting wouldn't be that much heavier in terms of uh, uh, ground support. The other, uh, so I, 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 I'm still totally in favor of that. The other thing I want to point out about parking, Hadley uh, in their zoning bylaw, they have extremely robust parking requirements. Yes. And I, uh, like everyone else in Amherst, do a lot of shopping in the Hadley malls. And what I've noticed is that uh, there's a hell of a lot of vacant parking spaces at the Hadley malls. And I think that is, uh, is an indication of an unwise bylaw. And uh, yeah, I think uh, better off uh, we uh, leave this to the market to decide and uh, yeah, uh, we have got to build something here that they will come to. That's the bottom line and uh, that they should be able to come to in the very near future. Um, or we're going to lose, uh, just from market forces, we're going to lose uh, areas of town that we don't want to lose. Great. Thanks, Fred. Um a couple of my own thoughts, and then I'm going to ask our attendee if they have any thoughts to share on this topic as well. Um, just on some of the points we've discussed, I lean more towards the acquiring mixed use as a start. As I said the other night, I think it's the right way to start. And then if it doesn't work, we can always, in, in a year or two years, we have no proposals. That'll tell us we're, we missed the mark, right? Um, I think on the parking front, a little more flexibility is great. I think 
we could build in the bullet point of that there will be a review and have that review have some teeth rather than just tell us you're going to put it in your lease that there's no parking might be a better strategy but maybe not requiring what's in the bylaw right now on parking um i'm fine with the sixth floor mostly because it is such a wide street area we're talking about with the setback i think it, i think it'll be fine down there um i i especially i like nate how you've made the uh, pedestrian street a little more prominent as well. If we're going to really try requ and require that as part of these projects, I think pushing back and having a little more height, especially with setback, is, I have no, no concern about that, really. Um, Janet's point about asking for more for giving the sixth floor on the affordable housing, stuff like that, I'm kind of on the fence. I feel like this is an area of town that Again, if, if I think we all see it at least short and medium term as student housing, hopefully long term, which could then allow our neighborhoods to in 10, 20 years recover some of the single family uses. Um, I don't see that as a real need to require some of that in this area. Just my own opinion. Um, I would favor just putting forward the one mixed use requirement to the CRC rather than both, Bruce, but that doesn't I think it's here nor there. Fine to give options because I have a feeling this is going to get a lot of tweaks and pushes before it even comes back to the planning board eventually. Yep. Okay. Um, I see Janet Keller is in the audience. Janet, would you like to add anything for this conversation? If so, please raise your hand. Okay, I don't see a hand. Um, so I'm gonna, unless anyone else wants to make any points, I'm gonna try and summarize a little bit this conversation. And again, I think the goal was, Bruce, you wanna go ahead? Go ahead. I only wonder whether, should we ask Nate to summarize because he's the one that actually needs to have it land. Sure, I was gonna, I was gonna add two or three points that I thought needed to get into this, then bring it to the planning board. But Nate, if you wanna do that, please go for it. Um, yeah, I mean, I've taken about, you know, some notes. I, um, so, I mean, my, the goal, I think staff was hoping that the planning board would vote to recommend this to, uh, council, um, this week, and then that starts the process. And so, you know, then they would look at it, you know, it's not their first reading. It's just, they look at it. They say it's a zoning amendment. They refer back to the planning board and CRC for a public hearing. Uh, there's that discussion process. Then it goes back to council. Um, you know, and that, you know, my guess is that if if planning board votes to refer it uh, to move it along this you know uh, this week, I mean, it's still a few months before it comes back. Um, I think, yeah, I don't I don't know about moving both forward or one forward. I I'm okay with either. I think I would uh, add a bullet or two about parking um, to change, maybe add a different goal statement. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, the sixth floor, I think I'd leave it in just for a discussion purpose. The, um, yeah, I mean, I think the give is that we are providing housing and it's, it's a, a critical need right now. Um, you know, I don't, I don't, you know, the, the inclusionary, I suggested that I talked about that. I'm still a little, uh, you know, unsure if we can, um, how much more we want to increase that. Um, and like I said, with the setbacks and the road right of way, I mean, the buildings are going to be like a hundred feet from each other across this, across the way. It'll be pretty big. Um, yeah. So I think, you know, um, you know, I like what, you know, Karin said, encourage and, you know, different modes of transportation. I mean, I think this is something where we can actually talk about that, right. Where, you know, we want public transit, we want uh, bikes, we want, you know, pedestrians. And so that's what we're building this, you know, we're building this into this kind of overlay. Um, you know, in terms of parking and height and stories, I think, I think, um, I think it's going to be a conversation. Each developer is going to approach it differently. So I think that if we require a seventy-five percent of the streetscape facade to be a non-residential use to a certain depth, and they have enough space, and they build in parking there, they might not actually get to a sixth floor because the parking demand for the mixed-use space will. Um, drive kind of how much building they can have and then with wetlands. And so I think it's a, you know, it's a pretty dynamic approach to this. I think 
uh, you know, Barry's project is coming to the planning board. They submitted a site plan review application. They're also going to the um, Conservation Commission. And there's a lot of disturbance to resource areas. And so I think, you know, I think University Drive has a lot of land use constraints. And I think there's a lot of layers that will be examined. So I think, yeah, I, I you know, ideally um, a sixth floor gets us more units. It doesn't necessarily get much efficiency for a developer or builder that happens on seven stories or higher because of building code. But what it does is it gets us more units. It may not be utilized if we require mixed use buildings all over the place because of parking and land use constraints. But I, I would leave it in there just as a conversation. And if the planning board decides in their review this week that they don't want it, then we can take it out. But um, you know, without having a consensus necessarily here, I would just leave it. Great. Um, uh, Janet's hand went back down. Janet, are you still there? And did you want to make a comment? I actually just this is I was wondering if we could require inclusionary zoning like if for students like so could we require that some of the like say it's like we have a 20 12 percent requirement for you know buildings over x units but you know if we what if we went to 15 percent or something and saying those extra percentages were for students because one of the things I've heard from many many students is they can't afford these buildings that are going up. And so I just I just thought like it would be nice to have some places for students on financial aid. You know, so I, I just I just wondered like if there's a way for some flexibility of that, you know, so we're taking care of everybody's needs. But anyway, I, that's totally, I totally agree with your point. My view on that is it's again market driven. Really. Yeah. So if there are enough more units, the rents can't stay that high because they can't fill them. I don't know if we're ever going to get to that with this project alone. Yeah. Yeah. And then I, you know, I think the, you know, obviously if you have required some commercial parking or retail parking below the sixth floor is going to look more look good because you get more units for that. So I don't know. But anyway, those are just thoughts. I was trying to think of how to help everybody, you know, maybe asking too much, but I know there's, you know, I could never have afforded any of these places and I know people are struggling to be in dorms. So. Um, Bruce, unless it's a direct response, let me let Janet make a comment or two. No, I'm just one. I'm asking you. Do you think that? Uh, do you want this committee to make any recommendations to the full board? Or um, uh, there I are think, five out of seven of us, so maybe I don't know. I just I think, thought we're, I think we're recommending to Nate some adjustments to bring to the board. Would be my thought. But okay. good. Uh, Janet, I'm trying to bring you over, which I can't. I'm just going to let you talk. Can you hear it, Janet? Go ahead, Janet Keller. <laughs> Looks like you're muted. Okay. There you uh, go. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, thanks. Um I um am glad to hear the discussion about the mixed use. I think that's critical. Um and um if any of these buildings are um not student housing, then one car doesn't cut it as a realistic thing. This is a car dependent region. Um, and I've heard many, many people on this subject. Um, you can't ride your bike in the middle of a, a snowstorm. Um, pe people who have babies, um, uh, it's hard to fit the baby and, and the groceries on the bike. The bus, uh, I could go on, but you don't want me to do that. Um, parking is a real need. Please keep some kind of requirement in there. Um, yeah, um, I think that, oh, um, if I did, I get nervous when I'm speaking, so bear with me for a minute. Um, on mixed use, I think it's critical, and I'm glad to see you addressed it. Thanks. Thank you, Janet. Okay. Um, how do the other subcommittee members feel about Bruce's question about trying to make a recommendation or just letting Nate bring this back? Next, it's on Wednesday, two days from now with some of these points. Don't see any hands. So 
I guess we're okay with just leaving it as is and maybe you'll add in those points and hopefully we can have a shorter discussion on Wednesday and move forward. Okay, great. Um, next item on the agenda. So we've got another 30 minutes until a couple of us have to depart. So Fred, you were, why don't we back up to what you wanted to bring up a couple of weeks ago with the full board, I think about footnote M and there was some confusion about your email, I think. So why don't you just open that discussion for us? Oh, thank you. Uh, yeah. Uh, footnote M uh, of course has a, a, a long history that uh, I was directly involved in. I uh, discussed this at uh, the in-person meetings of the planning board. I won't, go through it again now. Uh, it was reduced from 6,000 to 4,000, which I think is unfortunate. I think we need to look at that. Uh, there are a number of things around this that uh, we need to look at. One is uh, some clarity about what happens when an, an additional unit is created within an existing building it was never the intent that that would provoke footnote M, uh, that the that situation would be covered by the existing 12,000 plus 2,500 rule. Um, but that's not clear and that needs to be clarified. With that clarified, I think it needs to go back to 6,000, which uh, is a dimension that was carefully researched uh, uh, 25 years ago uh, around uh, what would uh, protect the general resident zoning district without creating a lot of uh, nonconformity. And uh, we looked at uh, uh, Victorian housing uh, mm -hmm. situations, including both on in my neighborhood and also and when I circulated that petition, I needed to get 100 signatures for the representative town meeting. And believe me, I got a lot of them from the uh, uh, Lincoln Avenue neighborhood, uh, Jesse, your neighborhood. Uh, and uh, when, uh, and uh, if you look at the original dimension and look at the, uh, the housing patterns, both uh, in my part of the town and also in the Lincoln Avenue parts of the town, uh, the 6,000 foot uh, does well in terms of protecting that. And I think I mentioned when I did bring this uh, up this history up at the in-person planning board meeting, uh, you know, this was came to a representative town meeting that uh, supposedly doesn't didn't pass zoning amendments. Well, this one, uh, it, it, it came to a representative town meeting and passed unanimously. A petition uh, zoning bylaw amendment passed unanimously in a representative town meeting. And after it was over, Francesca Maltese, who was the town moderator and a land use professional, sought me out, shook my hand, looked me in the eye and said, you just saved the general resident zoning district. And uh, that's how I got on the planning board the first time. The next morning, the, the appointing authority was the town manager. At the next morning, someone from Barry Del Castillo's office called me uh, on the telephone, a landline back then. Uh, and asked me to come down and fill out an application because they're going to put me on the planning board. I've literally drafted because of footnote M. That's how I started my first six years on the planning board. So uh, this is this is an issue that the, the people of the town want addressed. And uh, uh, footnote M is a powerful way, when it's properly constituted, is a powerful way to address it in a vulnerable neighborhood. Uh, and, and, and so uh, I'm happy to work with uh, this subcommittee and with the full board to, to make that happen. 
Sure. So, so do you have a specific recommendation? Like what, what do you think? I haven't, I haven't written it out, uh, but I can do that uh, fairly quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I could have that for our next meeting. Yeah, that sounds like a good starting place. Um, there, there, are, there are other things that have to be done around this. Uh, one is uh, on the issue of owner occupancy. Uh, when I brought in the subdividable dwelling bylaw, and that, that was another petition article that brought in, when I brought that in, there was no definition of owner occupancy, and subdividable dwellings require owner occupancy. And so part of that petition article was to create the definition of owner occupancy. Well, back then, uh, Medicaid avoidance trusts were not common. Now they are. In fact, I happen to live in one. And uh, technically, that means that the building that I live in is not owner occupied on the literal text. That has to get fixed. Uh, so there's a number of things that, that, that have to get fixed here. Uh, and this is this is not that difficult to, to do, but uh, I want to get that ball rolling as well. Great. Um, Bruce, your hand was up next. Um you Fred, this time and 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 on previous times, uh, you've given your discussion, and it's quite comprehensive. It's a narrative history of things, but I think we have to be clear in any big discussion that uh, about footnote M, we have to stipulate exactly what it is, and uh, and so far that hasn't been done, and uh, um, and I so I we we have to get used to being quite banal and specific, and and. Uh, because there are people in the listening audience, and we we can't just have a, a conversation uh, that that is, uh, is 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 a, is a narrative uh, history of the thing and so forth. We have to say what it is, and and uh, uh, um, and also it's so. First of all, that it's 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 specific to the RZ, RG zone. You said that, but it it was it was in the stream of narrative, so we have to isolate that, pull it out, and put it up. Uh, as a bullet point, I'm also not clear as to how this is different from having second principal uses on sites and so forth, uh, because I've noticed that we have second principal uses springing up in other districts. But um, so maybe this uh, footnote M is a is a is a is a, a regulatory condition on second principal uses. Uh, if that's the case, I think we should state that. So I, I want to get I want to get quite clinically specific about what exactly we're talking about. We're talking about uh, limiting the density on uh, on on uh, on on unit on parcels uh, unit parcels of land, and specifically we're talking about limiting it in the uh, RG district, and specifically I think it's limiting the uh, second principal use uh, uh, thing that seems to have become uh, um, more commonly understood as a possibility, although probably not because of footnote M has existed for so long. Obviously, there was some sense that you could do this uh, quite a long time ago, but I'd like to understand that. I don't, I'm don't. i not so much interested in the narrative history of this. I'm interested in the, in the mechanics of uh, the bylaw. And, and I'm not hearing that and I'm not understanding it. And if I'm not hearing it or understanding it clearly enough, then probably few other people are and probably nobody in the listening audience. Uh, I think that's an... Fred, do you want to add to that? Uh, uh, yeah, I can add a little bit to that. Uh, the the, the uh, concepts was uh, looking at Victorian neighborhoods, uh, which including uh, in many instances in my own, uh, over, over time, over the last 60, 70 years, uh, sing large single family houses have become uh, um, two and three family houses. Uh, and they have they have done so under the the ten the the twelve thousand plus twenty five hundred 
uh, requirement in the uh, RG uh, bylaw. Um, but if you have a large parcel of land, uh, then uh, if, and you start and you you uh, create a number of buildings to, depending on the the size of the land. Uh, if you were to uh, permit and enumerate all of those additional dwelling units under the X plus, uh, you know, the, the 2,500 square feet per unit, uh, you get a density that is totally out of character with the neighborhood. And uh, the uh, so the concept here is to uh, protect neighborhood character. And... Uh, the uh, a, a, a case in point is the one that we the planning board recently discussed. That's now at the uh, it's now under discussion on Faring Street, uh, where they were going to put a, a three family behind a three family. Well, the the most they would get on footnote M, the way it was originally in the bylaw, is a single family back there. Uh, that is an example of, uh, of how it operates. Uh, and uh, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to uh, work with uh, all of us uh, to, uh, I don't know, maybe that helps Bruce. Am I sure, discussing so what you wanted to be discussed? I, I, think I that, haven't heard maybe that. Maybe also yet. just the specifics, I, I'm not sure. I can't share my screen. Maybe we can work on that for the next one. Um, yeah, I can just I can let me sh I can just change that option right now. I just pulled up the actual footnote so we can see what it is. Yeah, I've been right. I've been reading it. Uh, okay, I mean, I've been, in fact, it's, it's been open on my thing here for quite a few weeks now. So, so. could I could I I think I, here's my understanding of footnote M is if there wasn't footnote M in the RG, you could have nine dwelling units per acre. With the current footnote M, you could have seven dwelling units per acre, but in the with the original footnote M, I think it would be four or five units per acre. Is that right? Am I? That's like I I need to hang on to that because I find the language so confusing. That's right. But where did you see that? Or did well, you calculate that? She just I, did the math, I think. Well, the the planning department did that for us a long time ago when we were looking at um, different density. Like there's we've had these different density drawing saying here's what you know five units or you know we did this for some i can't even remember why but there are these densities showing so they showed some lots and said you know under the existing thing you know bylaw we could have you know seven units per acre in the rg which even like an ex planning board member was stunned by you know and so i think under the original one it was four units per acre and so i find footnote m very confusing and i you know, I, I loathe footnote A because it's all over the place and it's super flexible. I wonder, for, my question for Fred is, can you get to the result you want in terms of density in the R e, RG by getting rid of footnote A on, on those, you know, the little additional lot and minimum lot requirements in the RG, get rid of the M and just change the requirements in the table? Could you get to where you want to be by, let's forget the footnotes, let's just put in the RG, the dimensional requirements we want to see. It, wouldn't that be simpler for all people like me who just struggle? And that's, you don't have to answer that now. I just kind of, that was my thought was like, can't we just put in the dimensional table? What we're going to see in the RG, I think four units an acre is beautiful. If it's all one building, it's so much nicer <laughs> than, you know, four buildings sticking around, but maybe not. I don't know. But I just think we should think like do we really want to have seven units per acre throughout the rg because think over time you're going to see that right go ahead uh i don't well i i think uh four units per acre is uh i i, I don't I, I think that is actually out of character with Victorian neighborhoods. I don't think that supports uh, enough. I think that is uh, uh, overly restricted. Uh, as I said, the uh, the dimension in 
footnote at. And there's there's different ways that you can get to the same result. And I'm happy to sit and work with people on this. Uh, but uh, the uh, what what we did is we looked at uh, Victorian neighborhoods in town and said, okay, uh, what essentially matches uh, existing density that uh, and and doesn't uh, screw it up and uh, that's how we got to six thousand and I can walk you through lots of neighborhoods. Uh, one of the things I did on uh, when I was looking at the uh, Faring Street uh, development, uh, I looked at, well, what would happen if footnote M hadn't been changed? And indeed, that would have largely addressed what's now going on on Faring Street. So uh, I think, you know, it is one way to uh, uh, address a serious problem. There may be other ways. I'm happy to, to discuss it, but I'm doing this from the uh, perspective of what is the function of zoning? It is to uh, provide an orderly transition in land use so that uh, their development does not create uh, uh, disadvantages to uh, uh, existing ownership patterns that uh, end up uh, costing them uh, value and convenience for do for doing absolutely nothing but owning property, and uh, by providing an orderly uh, transition and uh, a protection of existing uses, zoning provides that uh, disinterested third party protection. That's my understanding of of why we have zoning, and. Uh, that was the, the the concept, you know. There's other ways to get there. Sure, I'm willing to discuss them, but that's the point. Great, Nate. You wanted to add some info? Yeah, um, yeah. I think there's different ways to get there. I think the um, zoning amendment proposed last year um, with Mandy and Pat, you know, has you know staff thinking, and then with the you know with different proposals, you know, private development applications around town. You know, what is the right density? And I think it's tricky because you could have you know one unit could be a single bedroom, right? It doesn't have to be big. Uh, so you could have seven units on a property, and it would look smaller than some of the homes we see. And so, you know, I think sometimes to me this speaks more to like amassing. Um, and you know, we have different standards in the bylaw. We have dimensional standards, we have this footnote, we have massing standards, we have build out envelope. And I think there's probably a number of ways how they interact. Um, you know, what I was gonna say is that I think preserving the Victorian character might actually make the housing more expensive, right? It's actually counterintuitive, but it's working against us. If we wanna keep what's there and not allow infill, where does the housing go? And so I think, you know, four units an acre is not very dense. I think it's really about how does it look and how does it function. And so I think you could have maybe six units an acre with some standards, massing standards, design standards, and it would be, it would look okay. Um, at some point, maybe, you know, depending on how many bedrooms, it's really then, you know, how many occupants or the intensity of the use uh, starts impacting. I, I think it's a really big conversation. It's something that, um, you know, footnote M could work, I you know, I kind of think that uh, with the discussions in the last year, um, you know, it's a much bigger study is almost looking at RG and other zoning districts and say, what is appropriate density? Get rid of the footnotes and have more um, kind of design guideline standards. So, you know, Vermont just did that. Burlington, Vermont has some great stuff, you know, like St. Paul and certain places are starting to go that route as opposed to having kind of these, you know, um, you know, just kind of numbers that may or may not work out depending on the size of a property. And so if we had standards in terms of directionality of units, of curb cuts and driveways, uh, of certain things, then I think, you know, it, it, it's it's a much different conversation than just footnote M. Um, and so I don't, you know, I don't know what the best approach would be. You know, maybe it is 
you know, we have been doing the RG study a few years ago and we talk, you know, staff talks about it every so often. And I think it's a, you know, some might argue that RG is actually meant to be some of the denser neighborhoods because it's so close to the town center. And I, you know, I, I kind of want to think what is the, the right um, approach and right density. Um, but I think it could be more than four units an acre. I think then it comes into play what it looks like and how it's designed and all those things. And it, you know, I don't, I don't know. I, I'm, you know, I'd love to kind of look at this. Um, you know, I, I think it's really important, especially if we're looking at University Drive. We're talking about East Amherst. So we want to talk about areas where we can allow density. What do we do into some other areas in town? And so I think there's corollary zoning amendments that could move together in parallel or, you know, pretty short sequence together. And uh, this might be one of them. And I'm not, you know, I don't know if it's footnote M. Maybe it's just saying let's have a, a, a single family duplex, triplex, you know, quadplex definition and we are pretty strict about other standards and conditions that go along with that. And, you know, that's maybe where we go. Um, you know, further in the agenda, Fred, you're talking about a subdividable dwelling. To me, I don't care if it's converted dwelling or subdividable dwelling. It's really just the number of units in a building. And, you know, maybe it's within an existing building or a new building or ad addition. But from a zoning perspective, you know, it's it's the units, uh, not how necessarily how you get there. Um, but anyways, I, I I think this is a you know something we can consider talking about, Bruce, in terms of the mechanics. You know, is it, um, you know, what's the right approach? Mm -hmm. Thanks, Nate. Uh, Bruce. Um, oh, you're muted, yes, Bruce. I must have been unmuted to begin with. Sorry, I <laughs> I muted myself thinking I was unmuting. Um, uh, and this from and Karen and I have uh, been deep into this for quite a few years now on the uh, local historic district commission. But it's the the big concern uh, of the neighbourhood. Uh, I mean, there are two big concerns with, uh, and it's not really the density so much as it's uh, the occupants uh, of that density, and even more so the occupants of that density who have vehicles, and so we are seeing. Uh, modest densities. I mean, the, the Fearing Street uh, development that was brought forward um, last time to the uh, uh, by the proposers, Kuhn Riddle. I mean, the applicants were somebody else, but uh, the architects were Kuhn Riddle and Berkshire were the designers. So we've got some very accomplished uh, um, and clever design teams coming, but they're not able to disguise. Uh, a parking lot that has you know twelve or thirteen or fourteen cars. Uh, because um, it, this, uh, it, it, I'm I'm referring back to the uh, to the dimensional table here, and it and, and it says additional lot area per family in square feet, and that's the twenty five hundred. So it's it's, it's, it's sort of, it clearly assumes we've got families and so forth, and and families then become um, you know not more than four unrelated persons in this town. As I've mentioned, in other towns, it's three. And in Ithaca, it's draconianly, draconianly one or two. But insofar as we have a, a unit that can have four people with four cars, which is not uncommon, clearly uh, that is the problem that we're dealing with, I think, in terms of suitability of the development. And, and we can probably more, regu more, more, more satisfactorily regulate uh, parties and noise and so forth and behaviors than we can vehicles. And, it, and, the, and the, so maybe what we're really looking at here is regulating the uh, parking inclusions into the residential neighborhoods rather than the, uh, not to say we're not concerned about the densities, but I think you're right. There's a reasonable dent, there's reasonable expectation that this is a part of town that you, should want to um, put more people into because the Victorian houses are big and they're somewhat spread out and certainly on some lots, I mean, it's quite quite variable. Some lots are quite large and some lots are not. But those that are large, you can reasonably expect might become more dense. But the problem that we're having in the which surfaces in the local historic district commission first because they come to that commission first in order to get a certificate of appropriateness. And if they don't get that, then they can't proceed further. And we on that commission have really not got much um, say over parking. Um, we're trying to make it a little bit more so, but my guess is that what needs to happen is that we need to think about not just 
for the, the the language and the and the unit area and footnote M or something like it, which I, I I'm not saying is not relevant. But I'm saying that there is another thing that possibly and arguably is more relevant. And is, is there a way in which we can uh, regulate the number of cars and then, and most importantly, then enforce that regulation so right. that we don't see cars coming up on grass and all that. So that people say, well, you've got to provide the parking, otherwise they'll park on the lawn, uh, which is true unless that regulation is enforced. So limiting the cars and then enforcing that limitation uh, uh, successfully. Uh, and that's one of the things that I've been talking about with other towns and so forth, how that might happen. And see. But that seems to be a, 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 a arguably more important uh, omission uh, or, or failing than the uh, than an, the inappropriate number in footnote M. Yeah, thanks, Chris. I, I agree with that completely. Um, Fred, one more comment? Uh, yeah, I just want to point out that the way I do the math footnote M is not the the problem that was just discussed really, because that uh, would be uh, seven units per acre, the way I do the math. Uh, uh, footnote M addresses something else. Uh, uh, and uh, so uh, I, 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 that, yeah, I, I, uh, there's there's other ways to skin this cat, but uh, one thing I, I would also point out is that uh, you know there's uh, basically a, a space for dwelling, a, a parking space. That there's also a uh, a forty percent limitation on uh, lot coverage. So uh, uh, when you uh, put those together, then uh, there are, uh, you know, other limits that, that are going to apply here. I'll, I'll shut up now. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Fred. Um, okay, in the interest of time, I think we'll put further conversation of this off until next time. Um, I did want to give space for public comment. There are two attendees, Janet Keller still there, and Pam Rooney has joined us. Would either of you like to make a comment? Okay, uh, Pam, go ahead. Hi, thank you. And I'm very sorry I only only got on. I had another commitment and I could not join you at noon. And so I missed actually what led into that really good conversation. I'm so glad you're having it. Um, I was thinking about the work that we, that we did. I think it was during the 40R discussion and then the, um, the repercussions from the Mandy and Pat zoning proposal last year that had us looking again more closely at footnote M. Um, footnote M at this point, according to the bylaw, only applies to townhouses and apartments, if I'm if I'm not mistaken. So we still have we still have a concern or or an opportunity for more density, whichever way you want to look at it, um, if it is a <laughs> I, there's there's yet another wrinkle and that is that we have the definitions of a townhouse can be still anything three units or more um but we've got red subdividable which is three we've got a converted dwelling which could be four units and yet that's not considered an apartment so it we just have a lot of uh crossover with definitions and and um sort of rules that apply to each of these different types. I, I think it, it might be smart, as somebody mentioned earlier, to really speak in terms of the number of dwelling units rather than calling them an apartment or a townhouse or something like that, because it's it, it really is strictly the number of units. And as Bruce pointed out, those number of cars that are associated with, with each of those units. Um, so I missed the first part, so I can't really weigh in on anything else. But I really, really appreciate the fact that you're that you're hashing through this. Um, we just need to keep looking at ways that we can we, you know, if we if we have to add some density in the RG, let's not let's not let it um, 
turn some just pretty cool old neighborhoods into less livable um, situations. Thanks. Great. Thank you. All right. Um, so we only have a couple minutes left. I wanted, since we're all here, to see if we could figure out a time to meet in early July rather than wait till the end of July. So that feels too far to me. Um, I had proposed Thursday the 11th, but I think several people could not do that. Um, Friday the 12th, is that possible for two other of the appointed members? Friday the 12th, maybe at noon? I could do uh, that. No. Is that, day, is that whole day out for you, Bruce? Yes, uh, uh, I may or may not have mentioned, but I've got a, a, an impossibly hectic schedule through this month where I'm both completing the Habitat project in Northampton and unfortunately having to do a lot of unexpected work on my daughter's house in Amherst. So that's put me un un unexpectedly uh, tightly scheduled through uh, this Fred and month. Karen, how about you two? Any chance you can do Friday the 12th? Oh, yeah, go ahead, Ben. The following week, I'm 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 pretty open. Oh, okay. Um, how about um, Monday the fifteenth? That's probably okay for me. Fred, go ahead. Oh, you're muted. That would be better for me as well. I uh, am going in for major surgery on the uh, on the ninth, Tuesday the ninth, to have my left hip replaced. Wow. Okay. Uh, but uh, I will. I'm out of the hospital either the end of that day or the next, and then I'm. I can probably. Yeah, we'll do. Uh, we'll do I can probably sit here and uh, participate. So, well, your your willingness is appreciated for sure. All right, let's plan on Monday the fifteenth at noon for our next meeting, and then we'll also keep the other dates that I had on there, which was July twenty fifth, August fifteenth, and August 29th, all at noon. And I'll I will send that again to everybody, in one clear email, hopefully. Okay. Um, anything else pressing before we adjourn for today? No. Okay, thank you all. See you Wednesday night. Bye. Thank, thank you.